Welcome to your town. I'm your culinary host, Wendy Brody, art of food, chef, getting to talk with another chef and wine expert, Doug Allstrand. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. We go back, I, maybe not 40 years. No, about 25. 25, yeah. 25. This is the joy of our profession and living in this area. Nobody wants to leave here if they can <laughs> help it. So we all get to kind of grow up with each other yeah. and see our careers um, blossom. And we were just talking before we were on air about the experience we have. And um, yeah, I mean, I was I was a chef up in uh, up on the peninsula in South San Francisco when my wife and I came down here and visited. And we actually said to each other, we were just here for a couple of days, and said, God, if I ever had a chance to, you know, to work here and live here, I'd grab it in a second. But yeah, that'll never happen. So I went to Los Angeles, I went to Washington, D.C., and it happened. I came out here, and I, as soon as we got here, and, and uh, I said, I'm never, never moving. So it's See, been 25 years. See, you can never years. doubt what we wish for, um, <laughs> we materialize. Yeah. I believe in all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, I mean, when I came out here, I was the uh, food and beverage director for the Monterey Plaza Hotel. It was my third food and beverage position after being a chef for almost 20 years. And um, had had I not uh, had some back issues while I was a chef, I'd probably still be doing that because it's my it was my favorite job, still is my favorite job. That's so. interesting because I've always known you in your wine uh, capacity yeah. and um, you do such an incredible job with that. It's not, I mean, it is often in the career in the hotel industry that you move up the ranks from being an executive chef going into food and beverage and upper management. But for me, that was a big leap. I really loved getting my hands in the food, and it was hard to tell other people <laughs> what to do. And well, do. you know, and and I, I worked my way up through through the ranks, and I became an executive chef actually fairly early in my career. But I never stopped cooking because I always developed the menus. I always, it, it was it was never. Here I'm going to cook this. This is it. You always worked on things. You always worked with your hands. You always I, I enjoyed teaching uh, my employees, you know, how to do things differently, how to do them the way I wanted them to be done, and and working on standard recipes. And I I still enjoy teaching and and doing seminars and things because I just like to to see other people progress the way I did. But uh, when I was uh, cooking and you you know you're on your feet a lot. Um, <laughs> Boy, do yeah. I know that. <laughs> the, the bigger the position to me is is uh, you're you're on your feet less. But uh, I was working in in hotels in Los Angeles and um, ended up the Sheraton. Yeah, I was working for the Sheraton Grand in downtown Los Angeles. Wow. It's a four star hotel, and I was the executive chef there for four years. And then I. I'd never opened a hotel. I'd opened restaurants, but never a hotel. So I opened up the Sheraton Long Beach as the executive chef, and um, that's where my issues started happening with my back. So it, I ended up herniating two discs, and the oh, doctor yeah. the doctor told me that it was really just because I was on my feet all the time. It had nothing. There was no traumatic thing that did it, and uh, so when I I got through that. Um, Sheraton decided that maybe the best thing was to, to become a food and beverage director and not be on my feet so long, and they wanted to keep me in the company. And that's when I got that's my first uh, food and beverage job, moved to Washington, D.C. So, Very interesting yeah. how life takes twists and yeah. turns like and that. And Washington, an extremely interesting city. If uh, Visiting there is one thing. Living there is a completely different thing. I. Uh, my the hotel I worked in, you know, had the barber for the president, and at the time George Bush, the yeah. first one, was the president, and uh, he would go to the White House to cut his hair. But if you ever saw Secret Service standing at the door of the hotel when you walked in, you knew James Baker or somebody else was down getting their hair cut down oh, there. How so, and you walk out the front door of the hotel and turn left, and you could see Lafayette Park in the in the front of the uh, White House. So it was wow. a very interesting time.
And uh, to go from there to here was even more interesting because this is so different. <laughs> 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 you know, and it, the, the, the seafood out here so different than it is out there, so there was a lot to learn when I got here, too. So. Well, what would you say the differences are besides Maine lobster and things like that? What, what would be East Coast traditional? Well, East seafood? Coast, you see, you see more haddock and, and cod, and then they have a term out there called scrod, which is, which is not really a fish, but it's, it's whatever the catch of the day is, and uh -huh. it's usually from that family. So bluefish, haddock. Uh, cod, they're all ling cod. They're all in the same family, so uh -huh. so you have that uh, uh, different terminologies, uh, different crab. I mean, out here, uh, we're all up on the Dungeness crab, and yes. and that out there, it's it's the bluefin crab. It's uh, it's a completely different. And I still to this day buy that kind of crab to make my crab cakes because I oh. prefer those. That's where I first learned how to make the real thing when I was living in Maryland and, and um, I still buy that kind of crab to make my crab cakes because I prefer, I think Dungeness is drier. I think Dungeness is great when you crack them and eat yeah. it like that. But So it's it's different that way. So, I mean, do you, how would you get that? I mean, are there fish um, mongers Just, you, here? You, yeah, you, no, you got to look at the container. So they're, they're, they're commercially packaged, and just look at the container to see what kind of crab you're buying. And you can actually get it at Costco. Oh, place. <laughs> how interesting. Yeah, and it makes, it's just, they're, to me, they're much juicier. And, and uh, there's, there's other things, like you, you can find striped bass out here, but striped bass out on the East Coast is all over. I mean, it's on menus, and um, so it, it's a it's a, a kind of a different mm -hmm. because the Atlantic has different seafood in it than the Pacific does. So it's a, it was a it was a learning experience coming out west again. To uh, I, I I did my apprenticeship in Phoenix, where back when I was doing that, there was no such thing as fresh fish in 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 Phoenix <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, it was too expensive. It was wow. too expensive to get it there, so everything was frozen. And so when I was learning in the kitchen, it was more focused on the, the meat and the poultry and things like that. So, um, you know, one of my bucket list items was having bouillabaisse in Marseille. And I, I did that a few years ago. Oh, good for yeah, you. I did that a few years ago. So it's like my bucket list is a little different than other people's because it's more focused on eating and drinking and stuff. So. Well, I, I think all of us in our field, I, I, I know I have already done one of my bucket lists, which was foie gras and Chateau Ecam. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's actually a I don't know that I could do match that Match made again. in heaven. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, I don't know what it is that, that the Decam goes so well with it. Maybe because you know you're drinking liquid gold when you drink it. It's, oh. it's not an well, inexpensive we thing. Learn when I went to the first class of the California Culinary Academy and our wine teacher was telling us about all these magic pairings that were just, you know, to die for yeah. uh, or to live for, yeah, shall we go. say. <laughs> I mean, the foie gras is good with sautern in general, but yes, with the chem, yes. yeah, it, it yeah. Go, it's even even better. So, And when I, when I moved here and after I was uh, in the hotel here for a few years, I de uh, decided that um, I was tired of not seeing the sunshine. You know, I'd get to work at 7 in the morning and leave at 7 or 8 at night and uh, had the opportunity to get into the wine business. And I had become interested many years ago at the Sheraton Grand when the, the maitre d' of the, of the uh, signature restaurant uh, that was actually the new restaurant of the year, the year we opened that. And mm, it, it, congratulations. Uh, it, uh, we ran out of the house Chardonnay, which at the time was cake bread. Oh, that's a now not affordable for that. But yeah. So we needed to find something, and he wanted me to. He said, "I want you to be involved." I said, "Well, I don't, I don't know much about wine." He said, "No, but you, it's your food. So it's your food, and we got to match the wine up to your food." So I cooked, you know, some stuff up, and with with my restaurant chef, and then we sat and I must have tasted, you know, fifty different Chardonnays to try to match up and that's when I got interested in, in wine because I could see the dynamic and wine changed with the food and the food changed with the wine. So when I decided to get out of the hotel business or restaurant business entirely, this was my choice. To, my second love was getting into the wine business. And 
I think my background as a chef enables me to know what wines, I can taste the wine and tell you what kind of food it's going to go with. Well, I think that's one of the things that has impressed me so much about you with your culinary background. What better person that some of our food and wine groups that we belong to where you pair the food, I mean, I, Ellen, you pair the wine with the food, and you've just done a spectacular <coughs> job over the years, and everybody says so, but <laughs> we get to try it firsthand. Well, as you know, um, as a chef, there's a science to it. There's a science to cooking, and, and, and it emulsions and everything that, right. that goes along with, with doing the proper thing. But there's also a science to wine, and there's a science to both to pairing them up. It has to do with acids and pHs and everything else. So when you figure out if, if a food is high acid, you don't want a wine that's high acid and vice versa. So it comes with, with practice. So that's most of it. Um, one of my times up in Napa where I took a course, um, from Madeline Kamen, she had a little different approach, probably more like yourself from a food background, in that she would taste, that, let's say, a, a fillet or beef tenderloin, and then she would um, taste the sauce that was going to be accompany the protein. Then she'd taste the wine that was going to be served. And she'd back and forth it and decide, okay, my sauce needs a little more base in it, so I'll add cream, blah, 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 or whatever uh, dairy she felt would tone the acid no. balance down. Or if it needed more acid, out came the vinegar or the tomato or the lemon juice or all these different things. So it was a whole new approach as a, from a chef's point of view of it's not my way or my recipe. They work so hard on the winery and the winemaker's end. How do I help pair and match the two up so that the wine shows off so beautifully as hopefully the food will. Too. Yeah, and there's there's a process to on, on both in both directions to do that. Of, of I know that there are people that want a wine. They want to drink this wine with the dinner. So the chef needs to make food to pair up with the wine. Yes. There's also, uh, this is my own personal philosophy, that because of my background as a chef, mm -hmm. I want to eat the chef's food. So I then look for the wine to pair up with what the chef is making. I don't make the chef pair up with what I'm bringing. So uh, you and I belong to a few organizations together, and when I do that, I want, I always go and talk to the chef and say, and they go, well, what wine are you bringing? I said, I'm, don't know yet until you tell me what you're cooking. And then uh, I have in my head, I can, somebody can tell me, I can read a menu and say it's this, 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 mm -hmm. and, uh, and I will know what that's going to taste like. Unlike, you know, my wife will look at, at that and go, oh, well, maybe it's going to taste like that. But I can tell you from the ingredients what something is going to taste like. And then I have tasted many wines over my career in different styles, different varietals. So. I, I got a good idea, and then I really just need to taste the wine, not even with the food, to know that the wine is going to go with what we're having. So it's it's uh, I have good taste buds. I can pick up corked wines. I can pick up all sorts of flavors in them that that uh, other people um, miss sometimes. But um, so I think that's part of it. I just have good taste buds, and then put the science together, and it matches things up nicely. So. Well, one of the things that I think probably makes it a little harder, when you and I were getting our culinary training, there was pretty much the French Escoffier method yeah. of doing everything, and there were the classic steak Diane or Bernays and beef tenderloin and lobster thermidor, all yeah. of these things. 
and now it's a world of uh, celebrity chefs that anything anything goes. goes. Yeah. And so that must make your job a lot more challenging if you're yeah. not tasting the food. I mean, well, I, I kept up. I mean, I do keep up with what's going on. I do go out to restaurants a lot, and I do uh, see what's going on. But everything, I still believe everything, no matter what you see, of how Nouvelle or California right. or whatever, right. still comes back to the, the basics of, you need to learn the basics of cooking before you can branch the out and, and, and come mm -hmm. up with something new and exciting. So all the methods still work the same. So all the flavors still combine the same, uh, but there can be, you know, with, with, you know, we went crazy with these different oils and different nauseas and different this yes. and, you know, all the, the, they still had flavors in them that, that are, right that are the still the same yeah. as they've always been. So it, so it, it, it does, you know, there are still foods like artichokes and asparagus and stuff that you have a difficult time matching wines up with, but they are workable. You can still find things. But if you put things with them, that makes it a little easier, sauces or, or whatever it may be. But it, uh, That's a really yeah. good tip. Yeah. I, I remember tasting how challenging that can be yeah. when I'm telling. Yeah, so that, you know, even, even to the point of, uh, of grilling something, you know, grilled artichokes or grilled uh, asparagus will go better with a wine than just plain steamed with salt and pepper on it. So it's uh, making different flavors out of the things that are harder to match up with make them easier to, mm -hmm. to drink with wine. Well, you've also been awarded and recognized in many ways, and uh, one was Chef of the Year in Los yep, Angeles. in 1989, and yeah. 1989. And I know it, it may not be the award, but um, we wanted to recognize you for all the incredible work you did at the La Tote Blanc organization. And that opened my eyes to your sec second or third my, love, my, your dogs, <laughs> yeah, your it's dogs. A, I always refer to, to that as my other life right now, uh, outside, of, outside of my job, which is my life. Uh, for the most part, uh, dogs are my second life. I'm currently the vice president of the Domani Kennel Club, and uh, I, I'm a dog trainer. Um, I have two dogs. They're flat-coated retrievers, and you uh, and the organization uh, gave me a very nice print of a, of a watercolor of a flat coat standing out on the rocks, and it, I thought it, <laughs> it looked like it was out at Lover's Point. Well, my, it, like my it dog sure was standing be. out there. Yes, yeah, it looked yes. it was like it was perfect. But um, both of my dogs have five obedience titles. I compete in obedience. I don't do the uh, confirmation, um, what I call the fashion show. I, I don't do that <laughs> with them, although they could. They're very beautiful dogs, but uh, dogs enjoy working. They enjoy having a job to do, and when you train them and, and take them out into the obedience ring and they have tasks to perform, whether it be using their nose to, to find your scent on a, on a thing or going over jumps or something like that, uh, their eyes light up. And they I just, love you unconditionally. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. have to talk again and okay. continue uh, the dog portion, but thank you so much well, for coming well, and sharing you. your Appreciate wisdom. It. And anyway, okay. always a pleasure. Thanks, Wendy. <laughs>